Hey folks, uh, I'm a little sick, so uh, this might be a little irritating to listen to, even more so than usual. <laughs> um, uh, it's titled The Two Deaths of Max Schachtman by Julius Jacobson. It was published in January 1973 in New Politics, Volume 10, Number 2. And I'm getting this from Marxist.org. Um, all right. How we admired and respected Max. The quote, we, end quote, was, a, was small in number, of course, for how many revolutionary socialists were there in the 30s in this country? Only a handful of Trotskyists, and not all of them had that special feeling for Max shared by quote, my crowd, end quote. Some barely teenagers, others in their late teens or twenties, and a few oldsters crowding thirty. We respected James P. Cannon, too, but we knew him as Cannon. Schachtman was Max. We could joke and banter with him, and when Max spoke at a, quote, big meeting, end quote, at Irving Plaza or Webster Hall, we were always there. <clears throat> it was not merely that we were entertained by his razor-sharp wit, his polemical skills, his sense of irony, his robust humor, but primarily because we were clearing in the presence, excuse me, clearly in the presence of an exceptional political intelligence. Even back then, in his ability to integrate Marxist theory, political history and specific events, he had few peers in the American socialist movement. I and a number of my comrades continued to share these special feelings for Max for more than 20 years. It is not that we were political sycophants, though some were, or that we were unaware of or indifferent to his personal political foibles. He was not a candid man, nor was he a generous man. Indeed, in politics, he was possessed of a sort of vindictiveness belied by his surface bonhomery. I have no idea what the fuck that means. I'm looking that up. A bonhomme means that you're a cheerly, cheerful, friendly sort of person. Um, any, it says on Google, any French speaker will recognize that the noun bonhomie is related to bonhomme, French for, quote, good man, end quote. However, a woman can exude a spirit of bonhomie as well as long as she is cheery and kind. So that means that uh, on the surface, Max Shackman was very friendly. Or a nice guy, I guess. When he felt, quote, crossed, end quote, even on a relatively minor issue, he often retaliated with a kind of meanness that could shock his closest supporters. He was a combination of callous bureaucrat and sentimentalist. Despite these personal flaws, perhaps in part, in some perverse way because of them, since they gave him a more earthbound and human dimension, we remained Shackmanites in a political and personal sense. Shackman, born in Poland nearly 70 years ago and brought to this country as a child, was active in revolutionary politics before he was out of his teens. In his 20s, he had already achieved a degree of prominence in the communist youth movement as an editor, writer, and speaker. The Communist Party was one of the first sections of the Communist International to be Stalinized. Yet in 1928, a tiny number of activists and leaders did possess the courage to rebel openly against the party's long-established trish tradition of bending in whatever direction was favored by Moscow shifting ideological winds. Max Shackman was one of them. 
when James P. Cannon, old-time IWW organizer and a founding member of the communist movement here, returned from Moscow in 1928, where he had been a delegate to the Communist International Sixth World Congress. He managed to smuggle out of the, quote, workers' fatherland, end quote, a truncated version of a manuscript by Leon Trotsky that would later appear in its proper form as the Third International After Lenin. Even its abbreviated and somewhat even in its abbreviated and somewhat mangled form, Trotsky's critique of the common turn made an enormous impression on both Shackman and Cannon. The two of them plus another leading party person, Martin Abern, and Maurice Spencer in excuse me, Maurice Spector in Canada, emerged as the leaders of the Trotskyist current. Needless to say, they were branded, quote, counter-revolutionaries, end quote, and promptly expelled from the party by fiat. Shackman was 25 years old at the time. Following their expulsion, Shackman, Cannon, Abern, and their few co-thinkers regrouped as the Communist League of America, which soon had its weekly organ, the Militant. Five years went by before the Communist League of America had the resources to publish a monthly theoretical journal, The New International. For students of socialist theory and history, both publications should be required reading. The Trotskyist movement grew, but slowly. It received a significant infusion in 1934 when the Communist League of America merged with the American Workers' Party led by A.J. Must, from the Workers' Party. The radical group led by Must was as deeply concerned with American problems as the Communist League of America was absorbed with the, quote, international question, end quote. Joining Shackman as an editor of the New International, now the Journal of the United Party, was James Burnham, who had been a leading theoretician of the Must organization. Several years later, the Trotskyists dissolved their organization when they were accepted into membership of the leftward-moving Socialist Party. Inside the Socialist Party, the Trotskyists, I guess this is probably, I don't know if this is during the French turn, um, but the French turn was the I was like one of the first times, uh, there's a couple of different inter, uh, times when there was like a revival of entrism. There was uh, in the Trotskyist movement, I think this is the first one associated with the French term, <clears throat> which is basically like uh, the advocacy that the Socialist Party, I mean, the Trotskyist movement should try to uh, be a minority party, by minority uh, group within a uh, Socialist Party, a mainstream Socialist Party. Um, I think that was disbanded after you know, towards the end of the 1930s, or just uh, stepped away from in the late 1930s. According to Robert J. Alexander, I believe it has something to do with, like, Trotsky believed that, like, you know, that the writing was on the wall about the uh, Second World War, and that the Second World War was said to be, uh, you know, an event that would lend itself to a revolutionary situation, as had been the case after World War I, so the uh, French turn uh, entryism period ended. And then I think there, the, there was a split in international Trotskyism in the 1950s between the so-called International Secretariat and the International Committee about this very same issue about entryism. Should Trotskyists, and, you know, in the, de in the wake of the death of Stalin, or maybe it was even before Stalin died, but like should... Trotskyists be like interest groups in the Communist Party or the local Socialist Party. Um, so there was like a big split in that. Um, I believe the internet and I think the that era of entrism advocacy was spearheaded by uh, Michel Pablo or Michel Raptis, um, who I he was an important figure in Trotskyism, but I honestly don't know much about him. So um, take everything I say. As with all the comments, I say, with a grain of salt. But 
just trying to, um, if someone's hearing some of these terms for the first time, I try to bring some of my <laughs> very sketchy knowledge to bear on the issue. Okay, so let me get back to actually reading the text instead of just freewheeling my brain, my brain freewheel. Um, several years later, the Trotskyists dissolved their organization when they were accepted into membership of the leftward-moving Socialist Party. Inside the Socialist Party, the Trotskyists had their largest audience yet. They were soon organized as a well-knit faction within the Socialist Party, the Appeal Group, making enormous headway, above all in the party's youth section, the Young People's Socialist League. By far the most effective Trotskyist spokesman, whether in factional debate or public rally, was Shackman. Two years after entering the Socialist Party, the Trotskyists left. Sounds right. If, uh, if what I was saying was about the end of entrism in the 1930s, the brief experimentation with it before withdrawal, sounds right. <clears throat> that it was short-lived. But... Uh, Actually, the Trotskyists had sought to split, mistakenly in my opinion. Had the Trotskyists maintained in the socialist, excuse me, remained in the Socialist Party and conducted themselves in a more flexible and less sectarian banner, manner, quite possibly the Socialist Party would have evolved into the revolutionary movement anticipated by the Trotskyists on their entry. Now outside the Socialist Party, in 1938, the Trotskyists regrouped as the Socialist Workers' Party with a membership several times that of two years earlier and with a youth section of approximately 1,000 members. Max Shackman and James P. Cannon continued as the two leading figures of the movement. Max Shackman was the theoretician, the writer, the one with greater appeal to the young and the intellectuals within the party and its periphery. Cannon was the organizational man the proletarian-oriented leader, and magnificent orator. Of the two, Shackman was clearly the more thoughtful and independent personality. He would not permit himself to remain rigidly encased in dogma, never to review the validity of old assumptions and conceptions, even those he had vigorously defended. Above all, there was the, quote, Russian question, end quote. It was the Trotskyist view that Russia was a, quote, degenerated worker state, end quote. It was a state question, it was a, excuse me, it was a worker state by virtue of the expropriation of the bourgeoisie and the nationalization of the means of production. These were the achievements of the proletarian revolution of October 1917. The, quote, social conquest, end quote, of a revolution that were threatened by the reactionary political and economic policies of the ruling Communist Party. It was a view that was often challenged within the Trotskyist movement, but never effectively. Never, that is, until Max Shackman and a number of his associates rebelled at Trotsky's notion that, despite the Stalinist terror that sacrificed the lives of literally millions, and the complete extirpation of democratic rights and institutions, Socialists must come to the, quote, unconditional defense of the Soviet Union, end quote, at the time that Russian, Russia invaded Finland in 1939. Trotsky insisted that all affiliates of the recently organized Fourth International hold fast to the traditional defensist view. Schachtman objected. For Schachtman, the invasion of Poland was a gross example of imperialism. Soon everything about Russia as a degenerated worker state was called into question and eventually repudiated by Shackman. In the initial debates in the Socialist Workers' Party, U.S., between the Shackmanites and the Canaanites, there was simply no contest. Cannon and his associates could not measure up in debate to Shackman, Burnham and their co-thinkers in the party. A large minority of the party and a majority of the youth section lined up with Shackman's faction. Despairing of his leading American disciples, Trotsky personally rushed into the breach. It is a tribute to Max Shackman that he was ready to cross swords with the, quote, old man, end quote, whom he loved, respected, and feared. Trotsky was one of the intellectual giants of this century, truly a Renaissance man, 
and without question the most brilliant Marxist theoretician at the time of the thirty-six year that the thirty-six year old Shackman engaged him in political combat. Shackman proved to be not only courageous, but he even bested Trotsky in the debate. Inevitably, the Socialist Workers' Party split. The Shacktonites, with about 40% of the members of the Socialist Workers' Party and virtually its entire youth section, reorganized as, as the Workers' Party. Its youth section called the Young People's Socialist League. It was during the 40s and 50s, in the Workers' Party, that Shackman reached the peak of his intellectual powers and made significant contributions to Marxist thought. Above all, in his writings on the nature of the Russian state and Stalinism. The view that Russia was not a worker state, not even a degenerated one, but a society dominated by a new, oppressive counter-revolutionary ruling class, did not originate with Shackman. But it was Shackman more than anyone else who, within the framework of Marxist thought, developed and continually refined the theory of a new, ruling, quote, bureaucratic collectivist, end quote, mm -hmm. class in Russia with such detail, depth, and logic that his work had unique and singular importance. During this period, the 40s and early 50s, Shackman's, and R, hatred for Stalinism did not move him or the movement he led to compromise their fundamental revolutionary opposition to Western capitalism and imperialism. We were a movement, sectarian in size but not in outlook, dedicated to the third camp of socialism, the camp opposed to both capitalist and Stalinist social systems. The Workers' Party managed to hold its own... <coughs> Sorry, I'm sick. The Workers' Party managed to hold its own through the 40s. During the war, it gained considerable respect and members among militant trade unionists. No small part of these gains was due to the struggle we waged in our press and directly in the unions against the wartime no-strike pledge promoted by the Roosevelt administration, by, the, by conservative trade unionists, and, most vociferously, by the Communist Party. Some of the best labor coverage in the nation was offered in the pages of Labor Action and The New International, the latter a continuation of the publication founded in 1934. Following the post-war years, however, the Workers' Party, later called the Independent Socialist League, went into a more or less steady decline. It could not withstand the combined effects of McCarthyism and the demoralization that threatens any sect unable to break out of its isolation. There was not only a decline in membership, but a gradual erosion of the movement's revolutionary ideological perspective. Max Schachmann, a loss was no exception. In truth, Max died two deaths, a finite physical death on the 4th of November 1972, and an earlier moral and political death that has no recordable day or even year. All we know is that in the middle of the 50s, there were visible signs of a fundamental shift to the right in his thinking. He saw, as he put it, quote, an opening to the right, end quote, by, quote, the right, end quote, he meant, at that time, more progressive tendencies in the trade union movement and the American equivalents of European social democracy. Leading the Independent Socialist League into the Socialist Party in 1958 was part of this grand strategy. I was listening to a uh, thing recently, actually. Uh, it was talking about Eric Fromm. Um, doing activist work within the American Socialist Party. <sighs> so I wonder if Eric Fromm and Max Shackman knew each other or met each other. Um. The quote, opening to the right, end quote, turned out at first to be a growing accommodation to it. But once this rightward shift was underway, it knew no limits. In less than a decade, Shackman and his followers had moved far to the right of American social democracy. Having entered the Democratic Party to, quote, reform, end quote, it, they allied themselves with its more reactionary wing and became viterpretive opponents of the reform movement. 
By the time of his death, Shackman had become an apologist for American imperialism's filthy war in Vietnam, aligned himself with the ugliest elements in the unions, rationalized the racist practices of construction unions. His followers supported Henry Jackson in the 1972 Democratic primaries. In the election, he led the tendency of the so-called Socialist Party that gave tacit support to Richard Nixon. I tremble to use the word renegade, but what term better describes a man who reneged on his earlier most fundamental commitment to social justice. To say that he died, in any sense at all, a socialist is to denude the word socialist of all meaning, to deny the relevance and seriousness of what he taught us about socialism in years past. Shackman's political degeneration, his rapid rush towards accommodation with the establishment, coincided with the explosive disaffection of a whole generation of young people, had he been able to make contact with the young, who were fresh and receptive to new ideas, might he not have been able to guide some into the camp of revolutionary socialism, to move them out of the path that led so many into the pseudo-Stalinist posture that predominates in what remains of the new left today? Be it rapturous approval of the Maoist horrors euphemistically called the Cultural Revolution, or the totalitarian societies led by Castro, a Ho, or a Kim Il-sung. But why should any of these young people have cocked an attentive ear to Shackman's revelations about Stalinism when they were accompanied by apologies for the American bombing of Vietnam and plaudits for some of the most reactionary elements in the trade unions and the Democratic Party? How different radical politics might have been today had Schachtman and his followers remained loyal to the revolution and thereby have been able to make contact with and educate the young. It is this thought that mixes bitterness with nostalgia and sorrow at the two deaths of Max Schachtman. Thanks for listening.